I'm really excited about this lesson. I've actually been working on this message for a couple years now. This was always my backup message. So I was like, I've got to get it from being back up and be brought out to you guys. And so I have a lot of information, but I've condensed it down so that we're not out of here. We're not here all day, all right? But it's going to be in Mark chapter 4, and the title is The Response of the Heart. Let me tell you about Mark. I really like Mark. His name's actually John Mark. We find him in the book of Acts. But Mark um, is his Jewish name, or John is his Jewish name, Mark is his Roman name. He was really close to Peter. Some people say that he was Peter's secretary. And a lot of what we hear through the book of Mark is really Peter's firsthand account of what of who Jesus is. So I really enjoy his book and it moves from one event to the other very, very quickly. If you have an NIV, you're going to see the word immediately used throughout his book because it is just moving extremely quickly. He gets to the point and he makes his point and he keeps going. If you're new to Bible reading, the book of Mark is the best place to start because you will find yourself caught up in it and going to the next event, to the next event. I love this book. Now, the parable that we are looking at, we also find in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, right? Other gospel writers. And so we, I just picked Mark because that's the one I picked. Now you're like, well, what's a parable? So if you're new to church, you haven't been around, you're like, well, what's a parable, Mike? A parable are stories with a spiritual truth. Now Jesus just takes a common event and he's spoken a lot of parables. And we're going to find out today why he speaks in parables. But he takes, a, he, he takes a, a common event that the people at that time would be, they would know what was going on. And then he would put a kingdom perspective or a spiritual truth to it. Now the things about parables and Jesus' stories, when you caught it, it would either attract you to the message or it will repel you to the message. Now this story that we're going to read, this parable or this section of verses, we're going to break it down into four parts. We're going to set the scene for you. We're going to read the parable. We're going to talk about the purpose of parables and then we're going to explain it. Not a lot of, not, it's, it sounds like a lot of information, but trust me, it's going to be quick. It's going to be good. And my desire is for you to walk away from here, truly understanding how you respond to the message of God, how you respond to the word of God. So before we start, let's pray. Father, Thank you so much for your son, Jesus. Thank you for the stories he told and the parables. Thank you for the word. God, thank you for the music that we just sung and how we lifted you up. We talked about your goodness and we talked about the joy that is here in this house because we are followers of Jesus. God, I pray that you will help us as we look at this section in Mark. I pray that you will speak through me. Be with the hearer. Help us to hear the truths in your word. Help us to walk out of here having a perspective on how do I respond to the message of Jesus. God, thank you for what you have done. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right, so we're the scene. Verse 1 says, and again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. Now, it's really cool to have cool words in there, but don't miss it. Jesus has already been teaching by a lake, and now he's going to do it again. All right, he's teaching by a lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and he sat on a lake. And while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables, right? And in his teaching said, now we're going to stop there. Let me set the scene for you, all right? This shouldn't be hard. We are a lot of boat people here, you know, right? A lot of boat people. Everybody knows what. So Jesus is sitting there and a large crowd has come around him. If we look in chapter 3, right? If we're at chapter 3, we see there's people from all over the region. They're coming to see Jesus. They're not interested in his message, really. They're more interested in his miracles, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But all these people are coming, and they're pressing upon him. So he gets in a boat, and he gets off on the lake just a little bit so that everybody's on the bank. And now some people have said, uh, have shown pictures of, hey, this is where Jesus spoke, and, you know, I wasn't there, so I'm not going to show a picture to say that. But, you know, but there's some people that are like, oh, this is where Jesus spoke in Galilee or wherever he's at. And it looks like an amphitheater. So, like, the embankment goes up, and 
and stuff like that, and all these people are around, and he's able to communicate with them. And then he wants them to hear a story, but he wants them to hear a message. And the whole purpose for Jesus is to give them this parable because he wants them to hear truth, and he wants them to respond to truth. Now, let's read the story. It says, listen. Love it when Jesus says, listen. That means there's something that we need to pay attention to. He says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. Just use your imagination. We're going to talk about this in a minute. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, they were withered because they had no roots. Now, we live in the Keys, right? A lot of rocks. You don't really grow things in the Keys. I think we could really understand not, you know, something growing up for a minute and burning. Okay, all right, so verse 7. And other seeds fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed, it fell in good soil. It came up. It grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. What a really profound statement, right? Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now, let me give you this story. Now, if you were sitting there, then you would have picked up on this picture so vividly. You would have understood it. Chances are, in the background, there could have been a farmer doing the exact same thing Jesus was talking about. No doubt, had you walked to follow Jesus and to where he was teaching, you would have walked by fields where farmers were doing exactly what he was talking about. So you would have picked up on this picture so really, really well. So let me paint it for you, all right? So you, we all, many of you own a piece of land, right? We call it a plot of land, right? You have a piece of land, a plot of land. We, we separate our land by fence. You know, or some of you in South Florida might be bushes, but fences are bushes. Back then, they separated their plots of land by these rocks. So you'd have these rocks that would separate the areas, and that would be the plot of land, and that would be my land, and that's where I was going to to, to do grain, whether it be corn or wheat or whatever they're going to they're gonna try to grow. And now those rocks would have some soil in it, you know, a little bit. That's the rocky area, right? The good uh, or the, the thorny area would be the area that they don't cultivate. It's near the rocky area. It's got some weeds that grow up. You know, you could picture it, right? If you don't weed eat around your fence, you've got all those weeds growing up. You know what I'm talking about, right? So right there, that's like the weeded area. And then there's the good soil. And the good soil is where they're going to try to get a crop from. But the path, now the path could have been right in front of their, their plot of land where people walked. Or it could have been where there was rows in between of what they're trying to grow. And those, those paths were created because people walked on them. The farmer walked on them. The hired servants or the servants would walk on them and they would compact it. You know what happens with dirt when you walk on it in the same place over and over again? It gets really hard. It gets really compacted. That would be the path. And so the farmer has got this sack on him and he's got this thing around him and he takes the seed and he's just scattering out the seed. Not really taking any consideration to where it's going because he wants a good crop, right? And so he's scattering out some falls on the rocky area right around his boundary. Some fall on the weed. The weeds area, right there. He doesn't care. It's fine. He's, he's just doing it, right? And then some falls on the path where he's walking, right? Now, the results of that is this. The path that's really hard, birds come, and they just snatch up the seed. Now, if you've been to Lorelei's, and you've eaten there, and you've sat out there by the, by the water, they've got birds. And if you feed them, which you're not supposed to do, right? Not as supposed to. Like, you get a picture of the birds just coming and eating up, right? And that's, you know, that's what's available for there. I just wanted to use that for Mike. So, but, um, but that's, that's what it is, right? The path is available. It doesn't seek in, right? And then the rocky area, of course nothing's going to grow there. You know, most of you've done science projects. You've done the whole seed thing. You get what I'm talking about, right? You know, so it, it's nothing's going to grow there because there's nothing to deep, go deep into. And once it starts to spring up, then it gets hot and it burns it away. The other part is the thorns. And it's going to grow with the thorns. It's going to grow with the weeds, but then the weeds choke it out, and now it means nothing. It's not as for no good 
The, the seed was a waste, right? The, the purpose of it was a waste. And then you got the good soil, which produces 30, 60, 90, 100, what, it, what Jesus said. And that would have grabbed their ear. Now, the purpose of this. Actually, let me tell you about this, all right? Now, we're about to read, continue our reading. But the, the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they step out of this moment of the boat, right? Where our scene is, we're in a boat, we're watching Jesus talk. They step out of that moment and take us to an intimate moment with Jesus, where it's just them and a couple of followers or a few followers to where Jesus begins to explain this story. Now, skip this part and read the rest of Mark, the rest of chapter 4, or read Matthew 13, read in Luke, and you'll see the next stories or parables that Jesus shares. But for just a moment, they step out of that time and put us in another place so that we can fully understand what Jesus was saying and what he wanted you and I to know. And so he gives the purpose. Verse 10, he says this, And when he was alone, the twelve and others around him asked him about these parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? I read so many commentaries about this section. Many of them said this was some of the hardest verses to read and understand in the New Testament. In order for us to get a proper understanding of this. Now, remember, Mark is quick. Mark is going from one event to other. This is all he gets us, gives us. But for us to understand this, I'd have to take you to the book of to Isaiah when the prophet was the first one to write about it. Then I'd have to take you to Luke because Luke shed some more information on it. Then I'd have to take you to Luke. And then finally, I'd take you to Acts and Paul where Paul quotes the prophet Isaiah and says the exact same thing. Because when we read it, we think, well, Jesus is holding back truth from people. That's not the Jesus I know. But here is the premise. Here is what the, the whole purpose of this is. In one little sentence, Jesus came to reveal truth to all who were open to receive it. Now, one commentary says the secret has been given, been given to the disciples because they have responded in faith. But to those hardened by unbelief, the entire significance of Jesus' person and ministry lies in parables. See, many people were coming to Jesus for what he could do for them, right? And it was good things, right? It wasn't bad things. Somebody needed to be healed. If you start in the book of Mark and you get for the first three, cha first three chapters, you see that Jesus cast out demons, right? He had such power. He healed people. What power Jesus was displaying. And it got all out. So people were coming to Jesus and they wanted to hear or, or see what Jesus was doing and what Jesus could do for them. They were not interested in the message, and Jesus was there to give a message. So a parable, right? Jesus tells parables to separate the miracle seeker from the message seeker. And he did it so because he came to reveal truth to all who were open to receive it. And today, that is still the same principle. God's word is available to all of you. The truth is available, but it's only to those who are able to to receive it. And as we begin to explain this parable, you're going to see exactly what Jesus meant. You're going to see why Jesus would say this, why Jesus would quote Isaiah, and hopefully we'd walk away knowing that our lives could be different in how we respond to God's word. Let's look at the explanation. It says in verse 14, the farmer sows the word. Let's stop there for just a second. I want to talk about this before we get to the other. All right. So Jesus identifies who, the, well, what the seed is. The seed is the word of God, right? That's what Jesus has just decided. So all the seed that's being scattered, Jesus is saying that 
is the word. That is a message that Jesus came to proclaim. And the same message that he came to proclaim 2,000 years ago is still the same message that he is proclaiming through his word today. And it's this. The message is that the kingdom is here. God's kingdom is here. It's repent and believe the good news. That's the message that Jesus came to give. When you open the book of Mark, and I know I keep talking about that, because, you know, let me just say this. When you read the Gospels, you read the Bible, they don't just throw stories in there to kind of like go, hey, this is really cool. Let me think of this one. There's a pattern and a purpose So for us to gather all of what's being said, we read the whole book as if it was the first time we're listening to it. So Mark starts out with this this story of this guy named John the Baptist who came to proclaim the kingdom, right? He said, the kingdom is coming. He's preparing the way. And he says something really cool. He goes, I baptize with water, but there's someone that's going to come to baptize for the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus gets baptized, not because he needs to repent, not because of any of that, but Jesus gets baptized. He goes to the wilderness for 40 days, comes out of the wilderness, and he says this, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is here. Jesus' message was that the kingdom is coming, and the good news is that it's being established through him. So what's the good news? The good news is simply this, is that Jesus came to forgive your sins. That's the good news, right? The good news is that Jesus came to forgive your sins. So why is that important? It's because there's a barrier that is created by our sin between us and our creator, right? It's a barrier that we can't overcome. It's a burden that we have. It's a payment that is upon us, and our sin creates it. And because of that sin and because of that barrier, Paul, in the book of Colossians, tells us that we are in the kingdom of darkness, That's the kingdom you and I are born in. It's not really good news. It's not really exciting news that all people everywhere are born into a kingdom. They don't have any choice. They were just born in that way because of the sin they have. But Paul tells us that Jesus came to transform you from the power or the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And it's through the work of Jesus. So Jesus comes as your representative and he lives this life perfect and holy, right? But his sacrifice was displayed on a cross where he would shed his blood. He was beaten and he was mocked. He was pierced through his hands. He was put crowns on his head. And he did all of that because sin requires death. And Jesus said, I'll be your representative. I will go to the cross. I will sacrifice for you because I want you to be a part of my kingdom. And so when Jesus died on that cross... Three days later, he rose again, and God said, I am satisfied with the sacrifice. And now anyone who believes in Jesus will now be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's the message that Jesus came. That was what was being so to all these people, was that Jesus has come to give life. Jesus has come to forgive sinners. And then he goes on. And he says, some people are like the seed along the path where the word, the message of Jesus is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. And others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last for a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seeds sown among thorns, they hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word. They accept it. They produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Jesus is simply saying this. How this, is, this parable is about how you and I respond to the message of God. The first one he gives us is a hard heart. I want you to look at that. The hard heart. Some people are like seed along, uh, so they're like, uh, let me read that again. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown to them. These are the ones that hear but don't respond. These are the ones that hear and they don't understand. 
These are the ones that are unresponsive to the message that is being given to them. They're the ones that resist what is being done. Being the message of Jesus, the kingdom coming, they refuse to hear it. But let's just be fair for a moment, all right? Let's just, as I was thinking about this, and I've had a long time to think about this, let's just, let's just stop for a second, right? I think some people that are unresponsive to God's word might have a good reason. And I don't mean that, actually, I don't, uh, yeah, you might have a good reason. Think about this, all right? I don't know why I just stepped down there, but all right, so just think about this. So when you are, when we're talking about the scene that was set, right, there's the path, and people walk all over the path. It was the farmer, it was the hired hands. They walk all over this path, right, and, they, and it's compacted. Some of you, right, you've been beaten down. You've been, you've been hurt, right? You have, you come to a place where you hear, like we sung the song, The Goodness of God, and you come to a place where you go, well, I don't know about that God. He's not good to me. We talk about the love of God, and you're like, I don't know about the love of God. And you would say, I feel like I've been stepped on, I've been beaten down, so therefore I will not hear the message of God. I want you to hear me for a second. The enemy is not God's word. The enemy is not the person delivering the message. Jesus tells us that the enemy, it's Satan, and he comes and he takes away the word that is sown in you. Satan doesn't want you to leave his kingdom. Satan doesn't want you to come find hope and truth and love and acceptance and forgiveness. He wants to snatch it away from you. So when you hear the goodness of God, you hear the message of Jesus that he came to die for your sins, and you start to have those doubts, those doubts aren't original to you. They're things that Satan has played in the mind of people over and over again for you to stop and go, yeah, I guess God's not good. I don't know why God does that. I don't know why this happens in this world. There can't be a loving father. It's because Satan doesn't want you to hear the truth and he's going to snatch it from you. If you don't understand, he's going to grab it from you and you will stay in a place of misery because you're unforgiven and you never experience the love of God. Jesus said this, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Think about those words. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus says, have come that they may have life and they may have it to the full. Satan wants to destroy your life. He wants you to stay in misery. He doesn't want you to hear the gospel and the good news. He doesn't want to lose you from his kingdom. So today, if that is you, if you are in a place where you don't know Jesus, right, and you haven't come to find forgiveness, then for just a moment, I beg you, guard the seed that's being planted Hold on to it and don't let Satan take it because I promise you, you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. Now, the next three type of places that the seed flown uh, or fell, I believe, are for Christians and believers. It says this, the shallow heart. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word. And at once they receive it with joy. I actually call this the camp experience. I'm a youth pastor by trade, I feel like. So, uh, you know, you take teens to camp, they get really excited, they hear it. Woo, they're changed, their life has changed forever, right? You know, that's what I call it. But uh, actually, it's probably more deeper than that for, for most of us. But here's the problem. They hear the word, they receive it with joy, they're really excited, there's an emotional response. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of what? The word. Think about that. They quickly fall away. Notice the stumbling block is the word of God. So you receive it. You're different than the other, the, the hard heart. You're going to take it in. 
You're going to allow it to do something in your heart. It's going to start to just fester a little. But you've got all these rocks and these things underneath the surface that you're not willing to bring up and remove, that your growth is going to be like this. And when things get difficult, you're going to fall away. When you hear a message, and let me tell you, Pastor Trevor in 2023 Drop some truth bombs that were really hard to hear, right? And sometimes he says some things that are biblical. And God's leading him. We might go, oh, I don't know if I like that, right? That might be more of a sign of a shallow heart. I'm not stepping on your toes. But that might be more of a sign of a shallow heart for you as a believer. You receive it, but man, it's, oh, I'm going to struggle with it. But listen, the word of God is designed to change you. It's going to confront you and change you where you're at. You guys know that song by Bruno Mars? It's one of my favorite songs. Actually, it's really not. I don't really listen to music. All right, I just felt like Trevor always talks about songs, and I had to put one in there. So, <laughs> but that song by Bruno Mars, Just the Way You Are, right? When I see your face, there's not a thing I would change. It goes, because you're amazing just the way you are. That's why I don't sing in the band. All right? You guys know that song, right? Awesome song. Sing it to my wife. She loves it. Actually, she, I don't sing, but loves it. Listen, and I'm going to say this with all the love of my heart. God would not sing that song about you or me. He wouldn't sing that song about us, right? You're like, but Michael, God loves me. Oh, yeah, he does. He loves you. He loves you and will accept you exactly where you're at. You're at. He knows that you're a sinner, and when you're a sinner, you're an enemy of God, and he's going to accept you, and he's going to bring you in. But because he loves you, he refuses to leave you in the way that you find him. The word of God is designed to change you, right, to conform you into the image of Jesus. And when the seed is planted, but yet we have things under the surface that we're not willing to bring up, and you can identify whatever those things you want it to be, it starts to grow. But when things get difficult, because of the word, you begin to fall away. Paul tells Timothy, he says this, all scripture is God-breathed. I love that. All scripture is God-breathed. Not just a little bit, not just Exodus or maybe a little bit of Levitic Leviticus, but all of it is God-breathed. And that means that God spoke through the person that was writing it. Mark, we read Mark's gospel, and yes, it was his personality that wrote it, and it was his experiences that God used, but God spoke through him to give his message for you and I. All of it is profitable, right? All of it. And he says, it's useful for teaching. I love teaching, right? I think teaching is a really cool thing. Some of you are teachers. You may not like teaching, but teaching is a really cool thing. We can get behind teaching. The other is rebuking. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be rebuked. It's not one of my favorite things to, to be on the other end of, uh, but that's not me. The other is correcting. This is what God's word is used for teaching, rebuking, correcting. Once again, I'm really not a big fan of being corrected, right? I don't think many people are big fans about re being corrected. You have to have a lot of humility when it happens. And the other is training and righteousness. Speaking of training, Jake says that he charges by the hour and he'll help you lift weights. So, but training and righteousness, right? Those are all good things, but what's the purpose? So that the servant of God, so the you and me, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word is going to change you. It's going to conform you, but you've got to let it grow inside of you. When I was a kid, my parents, I was probably Ainsley's age, eight or nine, and we lived in Tallahassee. If you've ever lived up in Tallahassee, you know it's not a really good area to grow things. Well, better than here. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, but in Tallahassee, you know, my parents were like, hey, we're going to have this garden. They wanted to make a garden. And uh, it was in the middle of my football field and baseball field, but they didn't care, right? They were going to build a garden so we could have okra and tomatoes and whatever else they could grow there. So they got this, this machine. It's a tiller, and it tills up the ground. And so it starts ripping up the ground, bringing to surface the things that are underneath, right? Tearing apart the top. And would you believe it? A lot of the things that came under, up from the soil underneath were these rocks. 
Where do they come from? I don't know. But I mean, I'm in Tallahassee. I'm eight. I don't care about that. But my job was to go through and grab all those rocks and throw them out because they're not good for the crop that we intend to have. Some of you have rocks. They're underneath the surface. You need to saturate yourself in the Word of God. You need to allow the Word of God, the water of God's Word to overcome you and bring to surface those rocks those things that are preventing you from growing deep and having deep roots so that you can be a fruitful Christian. The third soil that he talks about is one with weeds. Let's read this for a second. This one, I think of all of them, this one might break my heart the most. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, they hear the word. But notice, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, no, he doesn't, he doesn't bash money. He says it's the deceitfulness of wealth. And the desires for other things come in, they choke the word, and they make it unfruitful. You know, we could probably say your time, talent, and treasures. Those are the things that he's talking about. What do you put your time to? What do you put your talent to? What do you put your treasures in? What's heartbreaking to me is that all these things we put a lot of effort into, right? We put a lot of good things into, and they prove to be unfruitful at the end. Now, I'm a youth pastor by trade, so I'm going to give you a little bit of youth pastor stuff, right? I don't know most of you parents, so if you think I'm talking to you, I don't because I don't know your story, all right? So I'm going to preface that before I say what I'm about to say. I have watched in my years in youth ministry how parents have put their kids in places to be successful. And it's really good, right? Those are good things. You need a good education, right? You need, uh, hopefully, you're involved in a sports or extracurricular activity. And, and that's all good things. And they have put a lot of money, they put a lot of time, and they put a lot of resources in those things. All good things. But they seem to sacrifice the best thing. They seem to sacrifice the importance of their time as a family with God. They seem to sacrifice youth group when it comes to other events. They sacrifice, and this is just eight years of being, seven years of being a youth pastor, 17 years being connected to youth ministry, right? If it comes to the baseball camp and the church camp, the church camp goes, I once told a parent, I thought it was funny, but they didn't find it as funny. I go, you know, the difference between me and your sports and your softball league is that I don't charge you. Maybe I should start charging you, right? You know, but we seem to do the good things in life and, and cultivate those, right? And put our efforts into those and our time and our resources into those. But if they all sacrifice the best thing, and the best thing is God's word being implanted in your heart, if they sacrifice all of that, listen to what Jesus says, it is unfruitful. What breaks my heart is I don't want you to be people that are unfruitful because you got so consumed with the good things that you missed out on the best things. There's this... Hopefully I don't get choked up when I tell you this story. There's this lady. I'm about to take a drink of water. Uh, there's this older lady I had the privilege of knowing for a long, long time. I would tell you, but it would tell you my age. So a long, long time, all right? And I've known her for, and her granddaughter gave her one of these books. It's pretty crazy. And it was like, what are your memories? And it was really cool to read and hear and to get the stories. And she goes, well, what is, what is one of your regrets? Now, this old lady who's now in heaven, she was a preacher's daughter, preacher's wife, grew up in the church, great servant of the Lord. And she said, when I was a kid, my mom and dad, we would pray and read the Bible every day, every night. And then she says, with my kids, I didn't do that. Maybe she got too busy. Maybe work was too much. But she didn't do it. And she says this. It's like a 70-year-old woman goes, whoever is reading this, whatever you do, read the Bible and pray with your kids. The regret of an old lady at the end of her life is that she put good things 
over the best thing. Moms, dads, don't do that with God's word. Make God's word a priority in your life and in your kid's life. Read the Bible every day and pray with them every night. Grandparents, when you have the opportunity, spend time with your kids in God's word or your grandkids and just use those opportunities that you have to make sure that you are trying to cultivate an area that you're focused on the best things. I want you to be fruitful, but more than that, Jesus wants you to be fruitful, which leads us to the last soil, the heart. It's the receiving heart. He says this, others like seeds sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, they produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. I want you to think about that. Think about the progression. They hear it, they understand it, they receive it, and they produce it. Much different than the other three places. This represents those who hear the word and they accept it. These represents those that who are ready to hear and receive the truth. Tribulation and persecutions don't stop them. Worries and wealth and personal desires do not distract them. Their hearing is active, it's not passive. They aggressively pursue the word. They allow it to take root and then they rejoice in the abundant growth. I want you to notice that the seed is the same. The sea never changes. What changes is how you and I receive what we hear. You're like, okay, Michael, so how do I be fruitful? John, or Jesus said to his disciples in John, he said, the one who remains in me and I in him produce much fruit. The secret, if you will, to, to fruit in your life is you remaining in Jesus Christ. You know what? Today, God, through his sovereignty and his grace and his power, has given us this, his word. And if you and I remain in his word, if we read his word, if we treat it like this resource and the life-giving that it is, you will be fruitful you will have a seasons of your life where you will be amazed about what God does for you. I want to remind you something. Fruit, right? Who does fruit benefit? It doesn't benefit you, right? When I go to the grocery store in Publix and I get bananas, right? It benefits me, not the banana tree, right? Bananas are good for me. When you produce fruit in your life, right, it benefits others. It benefits your home, Husbands, it benefits your wives. Wives, it benefits your husbands. It benefits your kids. It benefits your community. It benefits your church. Just think about the fruit that God wants to produce in your life. And the secret, which really, there's no secret at all, it's to remain with Jesus. Remain in his word. Read it soak it in, allow it to conform you, and leave here and have a heart that is responsive to the message of Jesus. Now, if you're standing here and you don't know Jesus, then today is the day for you to understand and know that Jesus loves you and he wants to save you. He wants to bring you into his kingdom. And what it takes is for you to believe. Belief. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. We've been challenged today to respond with God's word with, well, we've been challenged to see how we respond to his word. Some of us respond where we're unresponsive and we're unresistant, right? If that's you, then I want, I want to encourage you today to come to know Jesus. Jesus died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price. It's already done. There's nothing that you have to do except to believe. Remember, Jesus told parables so that people, so separate the miracle seekers for the message seekers. And Jesus came to reveal truth and it's open to you if you receive it. If you want to receive that truth today, I would invite you to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and ask him to come into your heart. 
I'll lead you through a simple prayer. Where the prayer is nothing, but maybe you've never prayed. And you just say something like, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. I make you Lord of my life. And I ask you to help me to be closer to you. And I ask this in your name, right? If you've done that, if you've said that quick prayer, but really if you believe today for the first time that Jesus is ready to take you from the kingdom of darkness, would you raise your hand if you made that decision today? That was you that said, you know, Michael, I've made a decision to know Jesus. All right. For the rest of us, right, you have been challenged and I have been challenged. How in 2023, let's just go back, it's a couple weeks, did you respond to the message of the word of God? All right, are there things crowded in your life? Are there things buried underneath the surface? Are you allowing the good things to be more important than the best thing? My desire for you is that you understand and recognize where you're at so that you could be fruitful. Lord, I just thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for Jesus and how he has connected us with you. God, I pray that we will respond to you accordingly. And I pray that we will, we will be the, we'll have the Holy Spirit to conform us to your son. Lord, as we take this offering, I thank you for those that give. Lord, I thank you for those that are, that are faithful. And God, as we step away for a few moments and we take time to do the Lord's Supper this morning, I pray we'll be reminded of the finished work on the cross, the blood that you shed, and the body that was beaten for our salvation and the good news. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm.